Whilst the civilization of the Earth Tree crumbles above, a new civilization blossoms deep below the surface in the ruins of a sundered civilization. From the blood drenched depths comes Moog, the Lord of Blood, twin of the Omen King whose ambitions would upturn the very order of the world. While Morgoat, his brother, seems ashamed of his omen form and does everything within his power to uphold the order that would shun him, Moog has proudly embraced the power of his accursed blood after a pivotal communion with a powerful outer god. The Lord of Blood's Mogwin dynasty surround themselves in a world drenched in blood, and the adherents of this new blood-based faith are drawn to his side and come in many forms ranging from merciless killers to displaced misfits. Whether by choice or by force, Moog has laid the foundations of a new order, where love and possessions are the rewards for loyalty. To the frustration of the round table, more and more tarnished are drawn away from grace and instead dedicate their power and effort to the Lord of Blood, invading the worlds of their kin in order to drench the lands between in blood. And at the heart of this seemingly insane and aimless cause is an even darker, more sinister truth. For the Lord of Blood's design centre around Mikola, the greatest of the Imperians. Positioning himself as Mikola's consort, he aims to ride the unalloyed's coattails to elevate his dynasty of blood to new heights. While Moog is scoffed at by the outside world, little do they know that the Lord of Blood's plans are far from harmless, for he dreams of a world drenched in his accursed blood, bound to his will and that of his outer god patron. Let us immerse ourselves in the blood of the Tarnished, as we explore the world of Moog, the Lord of Blood. We know that Margot and Moog were born of the royal lineage, and that being the children born of Marika and Godfrey, a fact that is confirmed by Godric's Great Rune. We know that these twins belong to this lineage due to Margot's Great Rune, which reads as follows. This great rune is the anchor ring that houses the base and proves two things, that the Omen King was born of the Golden Lineage and that he was indeed the Lord of Lindale. As such, we know that this applies to Moog as well, for we know from his great rune that he's Morgoth's twin. Yet, despite such divine lineage, the birth of these twins was problematic for the royal line, for they were born with the Omen Curse. Now, the Omen Curse is definitely the subject for its own video, but suffice it to say, it is an extremely reviled curse that leads to tainted blood, being haunted by evil spirits, and makes you sprout distinctive aesthetic features, such as horns and an unnatural skin hue. This is of course a less than ideal condition for a member of the Golden Lineage to have, and we learn of the horrendous way that regular infants of this affliction are treated in the realm of the Earth Tree, from the Omen Bairn item description which reads as follows. Doll of a curse born bairn. Omen babies have all their horns excised, causing most to perish. These fetishes are made to memorialise them. We can see this from the regular ogre enemies that we find in the game, as we can see that their horns have been cut down just to the wick, essentially just the stump of the horn that protrudes from their skin, and indeed the dung eater's armour is fashioned after an omen with their horns trimmed as well and as such it gives us another illustration of how regular omens would appear after having their horns cut off. Given the name of the area, the Shunning Grounds, and the fact that it is filled with omen enemies, we can then presume that omens were then chucked down into this area underground, shunned and exiled. Yet this wasn't enough for some people, omen people were so reviled that they had to be killed, hence we get the omen killers, hunters specialised in killing omen showing that these people are so reviled that they are killed, mutilated and exiled just for being born the way that they are. However, given they were born of royalty, Moog and Margot received a slightly less rough treatment. The regal omen Bairn describes the fate of such royal beings. Doll of a curse born Bairn from the Erdtree's royal line. Omen babies born of royalty do not have their horns excised, but instead are just kept underground, unbeknownst to anyone, imprisoned for eternity. These memorial fetishes are fashioned in secret. And so, while the main of the Golden Lineage got to hold court in the glory of Lindell, Moog and Morgoth will have suffered the fate described by this fetish. They would have been tucked away in the aptly named Shunning Grounds with the rest of the omen who survived their horns being excised, with the joy of having their horns in full. The two were of course problematic. 
They were of the golden lineage, and so they just couldn't be killed outright. But conversely, nor can they be allowed to remain in the capital as equals of the normal members of the golden lineage. Especially if we see the other way that omens are treated, it would just be hypocrisy. And these creatures of accursed blood certainly couldn't be allowed to mar the image of the proud golden lineage. And so, they would have been bundled into the dark depths of the Shunning Grounds, to eke out some kind of desperate existence. The fact we find shackles specifically for Moog and Morgoth implies that they weren't only just banished here, but they were shackled lest they escape the Shunning Grounds and embarrass the Golden Lineage. For example, if we read Moog's shackle, which we still find in the Shunning Grounds, reinforcing the idea that this was once their home, it reads the following. A fetish bathed in golden magic. Shackles were used to bind the accursed people called the Omen, and these ones were made to keep a particular Omen under the strictest confinement. Though faint, the shackles still retained vestiges of power, enough to trap the once bound Moog on Earth, if only for a short time. This tells us a number of interesting things. Firstly, it is bathed in golden magic, suggesting that this was produced by the golden lineage themselves using golden magic. This is completely monstrous if you consider how cruel the royal family were to two of their own, for no other crime than being born the way they were. It also says, under the strictest confinements. To me this reads as though they were even more concerned about Morgan Margot from ever getting out than any other omen cursed, lest they be discovered and cause any embarrassment to the proud golden lineage. The cursed blood pot can also imply the sort of cruel treatment that Moog will have experienced as a child, for it reads, Decorated with the crest of the Lord of Blood, throw at enemies to douse them in accursed blood, causing summoned spirits to assail them with a rabid fervour. A childhood memory of the Lord of Blood. So for me, what we can infer from this is that these spirits that assail enemies now are recreating actual memories from Moog's childhood, how he was assailed by people just for having the accursed blood, much as these spirits now react to people who find themselves covered in the accursed blood from the pot. Reading this does make me feel sorry for the poor chap. Both were treated no better than common criminals, and forced to live in squalid conditions and no doubt attacked and hunted for the way that they are, and this will have had a profound influence in the way that they develop. And it was here that the two would take very different paths in the way that they did develop and the way they viewed their accursed blood. We see that Morgoat would do everything in his power to rise above his omen status. For example, we can see in his sword's item description that he siphons his accursed blood away into his sword, getting it out of his body, and he is utterly ashamed and disgraced when his omen blood stains the thrones of the demigods and the Elden Lord during his fight with us, viewing it as vile and impure, and it kind of throws him into a bit of a frenzy, to be honest, he's that ashamed about it. Morgoth almost has Stockholm Syndrome, as he essentially becomes the greatest offender of the current order, an order that once saw him imprisoned for eternity under Lindell, although one can't help but applaud him when he becomes the final Lord of Lindell, taking his deserved place at the foot of the Erd Tree. Yet his twin Moog would move in the complete opposite direction. Where his brother reviled his accursed blood, Moog would come to cherish it, and it was in the depths of the Shunning Grounds that Moog would have a revelation and earn the favour and power of an otherworldly ally. The Blood Boon Incantation reads as follows. Sacred Incantation of Moog Lord of Blood. Thrust arm into the body of the formless mother, then scatter blood flame to set the area ablaze. The mother of truth craves wounds. When Moog stood before her deep underground, his accursed blood erupted with fire, and he was besotted with the defilement that he was born into. We can see that Moog met his new patron, the formless mother, quote, deep underground, and to me this most obviously refers to the shunning grounds, which of course deep underground. This is the most pivotal moment in Moog's life. Whilst no one will ever know Moog's name really in the outside world beyond those that serve him, everyone will come to know the Lord of Blood, and this is the moment he becomes the Lord of Blood. It is central to the movement that become known as the Moogwin Dynasty, and indeed I do believe that this place is therefore still sacred to the dynasty even after they establish themselves in the mausoleum under Caelid. The reason I believe that this area is still important to the Dynasty of Blood is because of the presence of a certain boss. 
We find a boss here called Esgar, Priest of Blood, who we know is linked to the dynasty not only because of his obvious name, armaments and the fact he has the blood tainted dogs with him, but also because he drops the Lord of Blood's Exaltation, a talisman directly linked with Moog. Esgar's presence here suggests a cult location within the depths of the Shunning Ground, and to me this is unsurprising given that this is the location of the First Communion that led to the birth of the Accursed Blood that they venerate so dearly, as well as the birthplace of the Dynasty itself, ultimately. And so for me, Esgar represents the fact that the Lord of Blood's servants still have a presence here, given its holy relevance. Returning to Blood Boon, we can find there's another interesting aspect of it when we look at the second part, as it reads, His accursed blood erupted with fire, and he was besotted with the defilement that he was born into. So the formless mother, on whom we will speak on next, seems to have empowered Moog's own accursed blood, leading him to wield enormous and various powers that he does during his fight with us. We know that she bestowed power on his blood specifically from the description of Mogwin's sacred spear, which reads, A sacred spear that will come to symbolise his dynasty. As well as serving as a weapon, it is an instrument of communion with an outer god who bestows power upon accursed blood. So if you had any doubt, don't have any more. The formless mother has literally empowered Mog's accursed blood. So it is different than Margot's. However, more significantly, it infuses Moog with the opposite opinion of himself than his twin brother has of his accursed blood. The connection between the formless mother and Moog is made through Moog's accursed blood, blood being the medium that the formless mother interacts with in the mortal plane. Therefore, to Moog, his defilement, his accursed blood, is something to be proud of, for at this moment it was his blood that gave him purpose and clarity for the first time in his life. This is also reinforced by the description of Moog's great rune, which reads, But Moog's rune is soaked in accursed blood, from his devout love for the wretched mire that he was born into, far below the earth. He now had power, real power, and unlike the rejection of his kind at the hands of Marika and her kind, the formless mother embraced him, empowered him, loved him, communicated with him, and this is all the direct result of him having omen-cursed blood. So no wonder he loves his accursed blood, he loves his defilement he was born into, because it is the very reason for his new being, it is the very reason for his elevation to the Lord of Blood. As a direct result of this, this forever bonds him to his omen heritage and the formless mother. It is now to the outer god and her Lord of Blood that we turn to in the next chapter. We cannot talk about the dynasty of blood, if we do not discuss the being that set Moog onto his current path. Before this, Moog was likely destined to die in the depths of the Shunning Grounds, no better than the other Omen Ogres that we fight down here. We do learn very little of the Formless Mother, but we learn enough to understand the role which she plays in Moog's story. Firstly, her name, Formless, suggests that she does not take physical form as normal beings or demigods do, and in fact this is supported in-game with some animations and some incantations. When Moog uses his blood incantations, he is literally reaching into the body of the Formless Mother and then pulling out her blood and spreading it as a weapon. We learn this from Bloodboon, which again I'll read. Thrust arm into the body of the Formless Mother, then scatter the blood flame to set the area ablaze. This is her literal blood that has been pulled out of her body. So to me, the Formless Mother exists in a very different way to which most beings do. Rather than having some set position in space or having an actual form, she exists along the fabric of our own reality as some sort of cosmic life form that defies the normal conventions of life. She exists beyond our normal boundaries of our world. Further highlighting this aspect of her formless body is the blood boon ritual weapon art present within Mogwin's sacred spear, and is the same ritual Moog uses in his fight with us. The description of the weapon art reads as follows. Raise the sacred spear and pierce the body of the formless mother. Stab up to three times, creating explosions of blood with each thrust. This skill will coat the armament in blood flame for a while. This is why we see Moog reaching up to nothing and piercing his spear into nothing, when he is actually reaching up into her body. So with that in mind, let us revisit the latter part of Bloodboon's description that describes Moog's initial interaction with this outer god. When Moog stood before her, deep underground, his accursed blood erupted with fire, 
So when he stood before her, it was rather not like him coming across her physical form, might like the player does when they behold Godwin for the first time underground. Instead, she let herself be known to him in some communion that would likely not be understood by regular mortals observing such a communion. As mentioned, the formless mother most likely communes with her chosen via her chosen medium, and this is blood. By setting Moog's blood on fire, that was her way of revealing herself to him and her way of communicating with him. Indeed, we know the Mother of Truth is most attracted to accursed blood, for if we once again read the Sacred Spear description, the spear specifically mentions the fact that it bestows power on accursed blood, not regular blood, accursed blood. So this means that her most effective mediums are people like Moog. And indeed, as we'll later explore, the blood that is used by the dynasty of blood, that is the source of their power, is derived from Moog. It is ultimately his empowered accursed blood, meaning that the Mother of Truth is specifically utilising accursed omen blood as her medium and power in the real world. Or at least the most potent version of it. But why is she most interested in accursed blood? Well, to me, the most basic explanation could be that no matter how reviled omen blood is, we cannot deny that there is power. There is simply a stronger power within the blood of the omen than there is compared to normal blood. We can see this in the strength and size of omen ogres and the power that Margot wields against us in desperation, and that is without him being empowered by the Mother of Truth. But in general, the spilling of blood and the blood in general in the mortal realm seems to be the way that she'll increase her power and her domain. But why is this the case? Why is blood her power? Why is this her domain? Well, if I can speculate for a bit, I believe that the Erter Gods, as their names suggest, are a bit beyond our world and are only able to communicate and interact through certain mediums or their agents. For the formless mother, her influence is spread by blood. This is how her power has grown in the world, and we'll look at that later, how her power and her blood uh, is transforming the world into her world as she would see fit. In this regard, she has chosen the perfect messiah. Through Moog, she not only has a champion of powerful corrupted blood, but is also in a position to usurp the established order. Moog is a demigod. He is someone who has the ability to claim a great rune and have great power himself. With her empowering his blood already, she has a formidable ally who can advance her aims, spread bloodshed, spread his accursed blood, and therefore spread her influence in a world that she cannot physically influence herself. However, this arrangement benefits Moog as well, for he is empowered and emboldened, and instead of just being a prisoner in the depths of the Shunning Ground, he is now the lead of a powerful sect as well as gaining actual powers. So let us look upon the Lord of Blood himself and what powers he has gained from his audience with the Formless Mother, the Outer God of Blood. What is clear is that when the shattering of the Elden Ring took place, is that Moog, like his brother, claimed a great rune. This will have of course increased his power already, but what is interesting is that his empowered accursed blood, his blood that is infected with the influence of the Outer God of Blood, actually warps the great rune that he is in possessing of. It warps the power of the Ard Tree that he has stolen. For the description of the rune reads as follows. A great rune of the shard bearer Moog. Its blessing grants a blessing of blood. Moog and Morgoth are brothers, and as such, their runes are naturally similar. But Moog's rune is soaked in accursed blood from his devout love for the wretched mire that he was born into far below the earth. Both Morgoth and Moog have accursed blood. Both have runes that have taken similar shapes. But it is only Moog's that is warped by his blood, meaning it isn't just omen blood that's corrupting it, it is in fact the corrupting influence of the outer god of blood, the mother of truth. I think this is fascinating because it shows that the shards of the Elden Ring can actually be affected by an outer god if their chosen champion possesses it and has their power coursing through their veins. This is of course backed up by Melania's Great Rune, which has been corrupted by the Outer God of Rot in a similar fashion. Moog's great power is boosted by the fact that his Great Rune is now intrinsically linked to his accursed blood, increasing his power tenfold. Another interesting point from this description is the fact it suggests that Moog's and Morgoth's runes are similar because they are twins. It is as if Great Runes are not set shapes when they are claimed, but in fact conform to their bearer. We of course most clearly see his power on display during our boss fight with him. 
he can travel and move around in the form of blood. As when we first arrive, he is sleeping beside Mikola in the form of blood, before he oozes out and reconstitutes himself as a corporeal being. Of course, as the Lord of Blood, he has the right and the ability to commune and touch the Formless Mother directly, reaching into her body, pulling out her blood and using it as an offensive weapon against their enemies. The blood of the Formless Mother is highly potent and volatile, and I believe it is the same source of the flames that we see flickering all over Moog's palace. This is the effect of the accursed blood growing in power. It's so concentrated in Moguin's palace that it is literally lighting the palace, much like the accursed blood itself burns when Moog uses it from the formless mother. So already we are beginning to see what a world might look like when it is fully influenced by the outer god known as the formless mother. As we've already mentioned, Moog is also able to gain power through his blood boon ritual a term coined by the purifying crystal tear that we use against him. When he uses this move, we see that he is able to directly connect to the Formless Mother's form. He counts down from 3 to 0, in Latin albeit, and he counts 0 three times, and he draws power from the Formless Mother, stabbing into her body. He pierces the body of the Formless Mother three times, causing blood explosions that damage us, but empower Moog. It is through this communion with his god that Moog is granted even more formidable powers. He is granted huge wings that give him an aerial advantage over us. This is an impressive display of power that really shows the Lord of Blood is not a joke and is a force to be reckoned with as he has a real power in the form of the Formless Mother. This is why I find the mentions that portray him as a fool to be extremely illuminating as it shows the ignorance that people who are observing him from the outside actually have about the true nature of the Mogwin dynasty. Before we move on from Moog's powers, let us discuss a small elephant in the room, the fake Moog or the other Moog that we find in the Forsaken Cathedral. Now, quite obviously this is either a projection or a copy since we fight Moog twice. Uh, for when it dies, the, the Moog, the omen that you fight in the Forsaken Cathedral, it has a slightly different death than the real Moog. He breaks apart into gold sparkles well, when he dies for real, he just breaks apart into grey ones like all the other bosses do. It's the gold particles that got me thinking about how how is he here, how is he a projection? So there are a few possibilities here. Moog has projected himself, uh, either to revisit his site of his first communion, which we've already discussed is clearly a sacred space, or he is here guarding the frenzied flame himself, as of course it would endanger his new dynasty as much as it would to the established order of things. However, there is the third option, uh, and the most likely to me, and this is that his twin brother Morgoat has conjured him up. See, it is the most likely to me because of the gold colours that sparkle when we destroy Moog the Omen under here. Gold is associated with those on the side of the Elden Ring, and those such as Morgoat who are from the Golden Lineage. But to me the most compelling reason for this argument is the positioning of this Moog, that beyond the secret uh, entrance uh, underneath the altar, there is another door. Now, if you have gone in here uh, after meeting Morgoat, you won't realise this, but if you go there before meeting Morgoat, which is what I did the first time I did the game, is there's actually a golden barrier, a golden magical barrier blocking off the frenzied flame. And it has a symbol on it which reads, Sealed by Morgoat, the grace given. So the use of gold for the sparkles, and the fact there's a gold barrier directly behind this, powered by Morgoat, it shows that Morgoat is clearly concerned with containing the sacred flame, as well as the proven history of him being able to project himself and have this kind of power of making fakes. And the location, he's extremely close to this location, meaning it wouldn't be a great effort for him to project another version of his old twin brother underneath. And aside from that, maybe it's even sentimental, having a piece of his strange brother nearby. This is of course pretty wild speculation on my part as to why there's a Moog the Omen here, and to be honest I might just be covering from softwares in um, fact they've just copy and pasted a boss here, but there you go, that is my take on why there's a, a, a copy Moog there. Any of these three are satisfying to me, but C is the most likely for me. That's it, and, and take it or leave it. Returning to the real Moog, I, I want to look at the way he's viewed at from the outside. It's clear that Ofnir does know a lot. We see him you know, fruitlessly looking for Mikla in several ways. He attacks Latena and interrogates her in a pretty British fashion, looking for the other half of the Halig Tree Seal, as well as selling his goons to attack the Albanoric village. But in fact, he doesn't know where Mikla is. He doesn't really know that Moog actually has Mikla. He's heard rumours, but he hasn't actually confirmed the fact that Moog has Mikla. 
So I do find it funny when you tell him of Moog's location in the Mogwin Dynasty mausoleum, but before you kill Mogwin, find out about Mikla. Ofnir has a lot of kind of derogatory things to say about Moog, and he clearly doesn't think he's a huge threat. And let's just listen to that clip now. Oh, so that's where the so-called Lord of Blood was hiding himself, eh? A fitting little squat for that deluded maniac to bleat about the revival of his precious dynasty while he turns our fellow tarnished into bloody fingers. Let him stay there. That way, his delusions will remain as they are, distant and unattainable. So he essentially belittles the Lord of Blood as a raving lunatic extremist. The sentiment is also repeated when we have a look at the Lord of Blood's robes. It likewise describes him as either a luminary, someone who's you know a great leader who knows a lot, knows the truth, or is in fact a raving lunatic. So this duality is present again in the robe's description. I think that the item description of the Lord of Blood's uh, robe is actually hinting more at the world's perception of him rather than what is actually the truth. The only thing that I'll allow that he is delusional about is maybe his relationship with Mikla and maybe he underestimates Mikla and how much he can use and manipulate Mikla but we'll look at that later. However, in reality, if the people like Ofnir and others who scoff at him and call him a raving lunatic really went to Moguin Palace, saw the horror of the blood swamps and the beings that are growing in there, these new life forms that are adapting and changing because of the real power that's found in the accursed blood, and if they saw the power that Moog can possess when he communes with his outer god, and if they knew that he was in communion with their outer god, would they scoff at him? I doubt it. So I think it's interesting that the world's perception of Moog as the Lord of Blood is that he's just a raving lunatic who's got a bit of a blood cult following behind him, that there's no real power behind the throne, so to speak. But what they don't realise is that he has actually made connection with a powerful being that opposes the existing order. And in fact, he has actually taken Mikola, the most powerful of the Imperians, to use as a figurehead and intends to use him as a stepping stone to raise his dynasty from just that of a raising lunatic and his loyal cultists to the new ruling order with a blood god at their forefront. Emboldened by his new patron, Moog would build a dynasty upon glorious bloodletting, and it is called the Moogwind Dynasty. When it comes to a timeline here, it isn't all that clear where the abduction of Mikola sits in regard to Moog setting up his dynasty, so I'll just treat them as two different subjects. However, if I was to speculate and make up my own canon in my head, I would say he at least needs to have the palace and foundations set up before he takes Mikola, so that he has somewhere to actually bring Mikola. So when it comes to the timeline of the Mogwin dynasty, I'll leave you to make up your own mind, because, to be honest, it doesn't particularly matter. It all still happens the same way. The symbol that Moog takes for his dynasty makes sense, as it takes the form of the three prongs of his trident. This is incredibly important and symbolic to the Mogwin dynasty, as it is actually the item which Moog uses to commune with the Formless Mother, who is essentially the patron of the dynasty. Whenever you use a Blood Oath incantation, a power that derives itself from the Lord of Blood, you will see the three pronged trident take form in front of your face before you cast your incantation. Now let us analyse the name of the dynasty, Mogwin. Now, when analysing this name, I have seen other people, as I initially did, trying to relate it to Godwin, showing there's some link to this, but for me it's not really the case. There's not any real link between Moog and Godwin, as far as I can see. There are some links between Mikola and Godwin, but again, another time. Semantically, Wynn does have an effect on the name, and this is what I started looking at, because I thought Moog Wynn was obviously just a play on Moog, and extrapolated to make the title of a dynasty, which is what I believe it is. So, for example, Godwin means a friend of God. So, Wynn can also mean a uh, friend or it can mean blessed in Welsh. So, to me, Mogwin is essentially an extrapolation uh, of Mog's name meant to mean the people, the chosen, the friends, the allies, the blessed, or whatever of Mog. These are the people of Mog. This is the dynasty of Mog, Mogwin, and his followers which perfectly makes sense. It makes sense because the grand designs of Moog's ambitions go far beyond a mere cult and just having mindless soldiers at his command. Moog believes that his dynasty will rise as a grand new bloody society that will replace the current order. As such, Moog has established his royal palace, the Mogwin Palace, an impressive if ancient structure located in the Eternal City, Nokron. 
We can learn a little bit of its location from the map description for the area, which reads, In the lightless depths lies the grave of an ancient civilization. It is here Moog, the Lord of Blood, is building his palace, to be the seat of his coming dynasty, named Moogwin. As we learn from the sites of grace in this area, the palace was once a mausoleum, and from the map's description and its location right at the edge of the Eternal City, it leads us to naturally conclude that this was a mausoleum for the Eternal City Nokron. So therefore, while it is impressive, Moog has essentially squatted inside of an already existing building of a long dead empire. Indeed, squat is the term that Ofnir actually uses when we tell him of the location of the Lord of Blood. The palace, though, is a grand structure, with large statues that we can only assume to be ancient Nokron lords and its inner workings are dominated by graves and burial sites for a civilization that is long since broken. This is a site of death. It is a place of burial that has been repurposed into a palace of blood. The location for the palace is a smart one. He gets a grand palace ready built. Certainly one of the most awe-inspiring buildings in the whole game. When you see it in Elden Ring first time from Nokron and from the river underground, you're looking up at it and wishing you want to be there the entire time. Secondly, he is in a fairly hidden location, where he can keep his prize, Mikola, well away from the prying eyes of his enemies, which is proven by the fact that even Ofnir isn't actually fully confirmed the fact that Mikola is present within the Mogwin Dynasty Palace. For whatever reason that he chose it, Moog sees this as a symbolic linchpin for his brand new kingdom. And make no mistake, Moog dreams of building a new society to surround him. This is evident by the various classes that already exist within the fledgling society. For example, let us look at the item description of the Sanguine Noble Robe, which reads as following. Robes of dyed black cloth featuring gold embroidery, worn by the nobles who serve the Lord of Blood. The grand metallic pattern on the shoulder is a signifier of the noble rank they intend to claim upon the advent of the new dynasty they are working to install. So here we see that Sanguine Nobles are actually working towards or have pre-ordered the position of nobility within the new society that is yet to be fully established. What is interesting is that there is a sense of nobility amongst the high-ranking members of this fledgling society. Vary, once a battlefield surgeon, even calls us low-born if we kill him within Mogwin Palace. And, just like all royal houses worth their salt, the Mogwin dynasty already has its own order of knights, as we can see from the Pure Blood Knights Medal, where it reads as follows. Proof that one is a glorious knight of the new dynasty of Mogwin, that the Lord of Blood will inaugurate. This is another honorific pre-order title, granted in advance of the dynasty's birth, showing that there is a class system already in place, in the anticipation of a new bloody society blooming. This is obviously important to Moog, for if you pay attention for the way in which Moog refers to the dynasty, you will notice that he always refers to it as our dynasty, not mine, ours. Whilst undoubtedly a megalomaniac, Moog is a leader who wants to be surrounded by allies, worshippers and confidants. He wants to hold court. Ultimately, he wants allies. He wants to build something together with other people who didn't fit into the regular society, with his nobles and his knights. This to me is an insight into the man himself, given the isolation and vilification he faced in his youth. It is no surprise that Moog now desires to be surrounded by loyal followers. Yet in reality, not all have come to serve the Lord of Blood by choice, as we can see when we look at the example of Vary and his surgeon brethren. The white-faced Vary is one of a number who were taken to be the Lord of Blood's side as he established his new movement. We learn this from the War Surgeon set which reads as follows. Blood-stained white gown of the war surgeons who were effectively mercy killers. Of the surgeons that were abducted by the Lord of Blood, none were able to tame the accursed blood. None but Vary, that is, though he was an exception. To me, this is one of the most fascinating bits of lore that surrounds the Lord of Blood, for it tells us so, so much in two very small sentences. So firstly, the set War Surgeon shows that Vary and his ilk were actual surgeons that operated in theatres of war. And what war has there been in recent history? The Shattering. To me, this is one of the very few lore tidbits that were relevant to Moog when it connects to the Shattering. In my opinion, Vary and the other nameless white faces were once battlefield surgeons operating during the Shattering, and the fact they were little more than mercy killers shows how brutal this conflict really was. Their surgery, quote unquote, would often amount to nothing more than putting a wounded soldier out of their misery, not being able to save their life because their injuries were so horrendous. 
However, despite this, despite their inability to save many people that were on the battlefields, at the very least they were people, individuals, who were familiar with death, anatomy, medicine, and of course, blood. This is what would have made them desirable tools for Moog, as the description also mentions the fact that none were able to tame the accursed blood. This to me tells the reason behind their abduction and why they were brought to Moog. To help him tame his new accursed blood. To find a way to control it and utilise it in his greater dynasty of blood. We will deal with the accursed blood itself in the coming parts. However, let's just say that the accursed blood is the blood of Moog that has been enhanced and it is his blood that is referred to as accursed blood in the blood boon description. In addition, we do see the influence of omen blood in the accursed blood, again linking it to the fact that it is Moog's blood rather than the formless mother's blood directly, for we see omen appearance happening on the sanguine nobles, such as their pallid skin and the fact they are growing omen-like horns. As again, we'll go into these effects in more detail soon, but just know when we talk about accursed blood and the accursed blood that Vary and his like were working on, it is Moog's empowered blood. It is clear that Moog then stole the surgeons to help him work out a way to control it, given their experience with medicine and blood. Yet what makes it clear is that it was so difficult to control that only one of them would have the extraordinary skill capable of controlling it. This is of course completely understandable given the fact that the accursed blood is essentially the blood of an omen that has been afflicted by an outer cosmic being. However, while the failure of the majority of these surgeons is understandable, it also helps highlight Vary's brilliance, as well as understanding the fundamental and important role he must play in the dynasty given his prestigious achievements. So let's talk about Vary now and his role within the Mogwin dynasty. Vary is the first NPC that we see in game and it shows the guile and intelligence of the Lord of Blood's greatest agent. It is Vary who waits at the Chapel of Anticipation, waiting to scoop us up as a newly arrived Tarnish and already influence our decisions. Like Rikard, Moog evidently sees the Tarnish for what they are powerful beings waiting to be exploited. Yet the recruitment methods of these two factions could not be more different. Volcano Manor comes right out of the gates, states their disdain for the rule of grace, and bids you join them in a glorious rebellion. Vary is infinitely more subtle. He is well-spoken, intelligent, and even empathetic on the surface. He is the first kind face and calming influence we see in a world gone mad. Indeed, his weapon, Vary's bouquet, describes this aspect of the man very well. For it says, this weapon reflects the white mask Vary's manner of speech rather well, enticing in its splendour, but full of deadly consequence. He appears as a friend and mentions nothing of his own agenda or affiliation to the Lord of Blood. Instead, he actually encourages us to fly straight to join the tarnished of the Round Table Hold. As we speak to Roderica on Storm Hill, we learn that he is evidently doing the same thing to every tarnished that he meets. In doing so, he probably believes that he will not only weed out the weak, but also that we will come to the inevitable conclusion that he has, that the two fingers are not worthy of our loyalty, they are weak, and the tarnished of the round table that do serve them are blowhards and are has-beens. This is just my interpretation of the way that Vary behaves. Make your own interpretations, of course. He encourages down the path of blood slowly, before dropping a couple of festering bloody fingers into our hands, encouraging us to spill our first drops of blood for the Lord of Blood, and then, after feeding our doubts and making us misbehave from the way of the two fingers, he fully inducts us into the Lord of Blood's service. Yet he has one final test for us before we are inducted. This is the test of the Lord of Blood's favour. A white, pure cloth we must stain with the blood of a finger maiden. Blood for the Lord of Blood, and a finger maiden's blood to show your dissatisfaction and disassociation with the current order to which you are forced into. Vary's role here shows how important he is considered to be my mole, as he is important enough to induct and select knights for his new order. Vary also represents Moog as Moog wants to be represented in the greater world to potential recruits, as a loving patriarch of a new order, far removed from the uncaring order of the Two Fingers. To a degree this is true, the two fingers are inhuman and therefore appear uncaring, whereas Moog does appear like he's warm, loving and rewards those who follow him. He is someone who's experienced isolation and dissatisfaction with the current order himself, and in that way he is a sympathetic character. Vary seems to embody this very ideal. He speaks eloquently and warmly, much like a mentor. When referring to Moog, he uses the word love. Love, love, as if it's an attempt to draw in those who feel isolated alone 
and mistreated, much as Moog himself once did. Indeed, Varys' own weaponry, which we've already talked about, is the romanticisation of the Dynasty of Blood. For his weapon is a mace shaped after the bouquet of blood roses. Vary is the face of the dynasty, sophisticated, noble, warm, but utterly deadly. Yet why did Vary and the other surgeons stay behind and become loyal servants of the Lord of Blood after being kidnapped? Why would you do this? Why would you help your abductor? Well, Vary has evidently gained a love for Moog due to his prestigious position and the respect he gets from Moog and being able to work alongside a demigod such as Moog, the other surgeons that, for example, attack us in the grounds of Moogwin Palace must have stayed for another reason, and the very way they interact with us clearly shows that reason. Bloodletting. And I think that their love of bloodletting is pretty logical, um, and their reasons for staying are pretty logical if we analyse them a little bit. First of all, I see it's a result of Moog's own style of leadership. Again, I refer to the love that Vary seems to be encouraging that Moog actually possesses. I'm starting to believe that if you were in this world and you didn't have a real good role within the world and you felt a little bit out of place, that Moog would be an extremely attractive and charismatic leader. I think he is a bit of a captivating leader in that respect, who instills a sense of love and brotherhood within his order, uh, an order of dissidents who have been rejected by the main society. Secondly, I suggest the other reason, which is a little bit more sinister and, and probably the main reason to be honest, is that on the blood-soaked fields of the battlefields of the Shattering, the minds of the war surgeons could warp after seeing so much death and so much blood and develop a taste for blood. Um, they are essentially mercy killers, so they've killed a lot of people at this point, and maybe it went beyond mercy and they in fact developed a taste for blood. And now they are no better than any of the other bloody fingers, obsessed with the spilling of blood. And therefore, they serve the Lord of Blood in another way that they couldn't do as medical professionals. Either way, I went over the war surgeons in, in depth because Vary played an important role in the dynasty, and that was the taming of the accursed blood, which is the real source and core of the dynasty's power. And so let us explore the accursed blood now. Regardless of how it's done, Moog's accursed blood has been weaponized and brought under a degree of control by him and his minions. In various ways, such as weapons and as a medium for transportation and transmutation. Yet more importantly, the accursed blood is used to bind those who serve the dynasty together. If you complete Vary's questline, then you see the truth of this firsthand. He asks you to pass his finger, and if you watch the animation closely, it looks like he is administering a syringe of something being pierced under your fingernail. And this is in fact reinforced by the bloody finger item description which describes the fact that something has been injected under your fingernail. After he's done this, he proclaims that we are now bound to Moog and the rest of his servants, that this operation that he's done to us, that this finger, is what binds us together. If you then examine the bloody finger item that you received during the ceremony, you realise this isn't just a finger, like the one used by the recusants. No, this is in fact your finger, as the item description reads as follows. Glistening blood has been siphoned into the nail of this finger. Its sickly, pale skin feels nothing now, but the nail still itches with the sweetest pain. The fact we still feel the pain of it shows that it is actually ours, and also the illustration does not show a severed finger like the other ones, like the recusant's invasion finger, but in fact shows a finger very much still attached to a hand. It is a powerful marker of brotherhood, bound by a shared blood, the accursed blood of Moog. It is very symbolic, but also a practical act, administered by one who used to be a surgeon. It is practical because we can now use our bloodied finger to invade other tarnished at will, over and over and over again. And indeed, the single use, festering bloody fingers, must have been fingers that were afflicted in a similar manner and then lobbed off to be used by loyal fingers. This ability to teleport and invade at will is in line what we can see with other uses of the accursed blood. Both Moog and the nobles, who I argue are closest to Moog in their physical form and powers, can travel through blood and blood form, and now as a bloody finger, we can travel through the accursed blood as well. Aside from our bloodied finger that has now gone pale like omen skin, we can also see other physical effects that show the blood has really had an effect on our body and is coursing through our veins. For after this ritual, our eyes gain a sickly, reddy, smoky hue, showing that the accursed blood is fully infected our body. Barry is right, this really does bind us to Moog and the other fingers. We now all literally share the same blood. The bloody fingers themselves are therefore the product of Moog's accursed blood, 
and no mere cultists, they have real power. Of course to Moog they are his pure blood knights of his new order, but to the outside world they are the reviled bloody fingers, blood crazed fiends. Indeed, Euro, hunter of bloody fingers, describes them as tarnished in thrall to cessblood, that they are no longer in control of their own actions, they are lost to their infected blood. The cessblood being another word for what we now know to be the accursed blood of Mo. And from what we learn from these tarnished that serve the bloody fingers, this is a correct assumption in some regards. For example, the infamous Okina. His mass description tells us everything that we need to know about him. Here was a man who became obsessed with the act of battle itself, more than the reasons he had for why he once went to battle, and his journey to become a bloody finger is explained by the Rivers of Blood description, his signature weapon, as it describes a meeting between Okina and Moog, where it says that Moog felt Okina's blade. No doubt Okina was attempting to kill Moog in a blood fueled frenzy. But instead of Moog killing him or striking him down or fighting back, he saw an opportunity for a useful tool, and he offered an opportunity far too tempting to a psychopath like Okina. The ability to be a bloody finger, to invade and slake his bloodthirst forevermore, and in return, Moog would receive his offerings of blood. The famous Eleonora, on the other hand, considered by Yura to be the most dangerous of the Bloody Fingers, once had a proud legacy as a noble knight, but now her legacy has been tainted by the Bloody Fingers. No doubt her recent transformation to a bloodthirsty knight has been caused by the Dragon Communion she has so clearly partaken in. One of the first warnings that we receive from Yura is in fact that Dragon Communion can lead to a hunger that cannot be sated. Whatever the reasons for wishing it, the Bloody Fingers seem to be tarnished who crave battle and death, and in return for spilling blood in Moog's name, they are granted the ability to invade and seek battle as much as they wish, to sate that hunger which otherwise would go unrequited. The purpose of the Bloody Fingers to Moog is to spill blood that will sate the thirst of Mikola's cocoon, and this is described by the Blood Lord's exultation but we'll go into that more later when we look at Mikola in the next part of the video. However, for me, aside from the Bloody Fingers, it is the Sanguine Noble that best represents the effect that the Accursed Blood can have on someone, as they essentially seem to be taking after Moog in lots of ways. And we've mentioned a few of these again, but I'll, I'll go over it again just for the sake of this part of the video. Like Moog, they can travel through blood, and they seem to be transforming into a sort of pseudo-omen due to the omen infection within the Accursed Blood. They begin to sport the same type of omen horns that Moog has, as well as sporting the same pallid skin tone that Moog has. Uh, on a note on the horns, these aren't actually just a part of the outfit that are meant to be symbolic of Moog uh, or representative of him. If you wear the Sanguine Noble outfit yourself, you will see you do not have those horns. These horns are genuinely a part of the physiology of these blood nobles. Aside from offensive and utility purposes, we can see that the accursed blood has uh, some interesting transformative and mutative powers, and as a case study of that we are going to turn to the putrid blood soaked mires of the Mogwin Palace. As to be expected as the very foundation of this new empire, it is covered in blood. Even the first holding of the Mogwin dynasty is suitably mired in blood. The palace is literally situated in a stinking, festering bog of blood. And now let us read the description of the Swarm of Flies incantation, which gives us a little bit of an insight into this. It reads, The new palace of the Lord of Blood lies in a swamp of festering blood, and these flies are said to have spawned from excrement in that land. Indeed, we find the Mogwin Palace resting in this stagnant pile of blood, rising above it and casting an ominous but dramatic shadow. The Mogwin Palace map can once again give us further context as to this location, and what abominable horrors we can expect to find in this blood-drenched land. It reads as follows. In the lightless depths lies the grave of an ancient civilization. It is here Moog, the Lord of Blood, is building his palace to be the seat of his coming dynasty named Mogwin, and whatever nightmares that may bring. What nightmares does this map refer to? Well, one needs to only have spent five minutes in this horrendous area to understand how nightmarish things can get. Let's first zoom out from the palace though, and have a look at the first instance of the Lord of Blood's corruption that we will most likely find on our journey as a new player, the Rose Church. The signs of the accursed blood is pretty clear here. Firstly, we can see that the whole water in this area is blood soaked, and the influence of blood, and therefore the formless mother and the Lord of Blood, allows a sanguine noble to translate here, to move through the blood and rise through a bloody portal. Second, we see these 
warty blood growths that we will come to see are pretty symbolic of the accursed blood's influence as we see them here and quite prominently on life forms that have been affected by the accursed blood and in the swamps of Mogwin Palace. The blood rose also grows in abundance here and we can see from their description that these two grow in festering blood and it is symbolic of Moog's reign, hence why Vary has incorporated those into his weaponry as a symbolic gesture. What is interesting is that we can use this information to show the fact there's actually the Lord of Blood's influence in Hate Fort, the Fort of Kenneth Hate, who he gets us to retake for him from one of the Godric soldiers that have come from Stormvale. Now it seems that this soldier isn't just operating under Godric's orders, but seems to be obsessed with blood. We can see this from the Ash of War that he uses against us, and the fact that there are blood roses growing in this area. Again, showing that anything that has to do with the Cursed Blood, whether it be a weapon art or anything else, draws the influence of the Lord of Blood and the Formless Mother. So when these lo two locations I've mentioned, Rose Church and Fort Hate, we can see small subtle signs of the Accursed Blood's corruption and a microcosm of what the world might look like under that rule. One final thing of note at the Rose Church is the three Alban Oryx that we find here. They aren't like the others in the area that are just patrolling the lake, these three are standing right outside the church and just staring at it, as if they are mesmerised by its presence. So once again, the Alban Orcs find themselves into one of my lore videos. <laughs> so their presence is significant here at the Rose Church, because a huge amount of Alban Orcs have now found themselves enthralled to the Lord of Blood. As we enter the bloody marshlands of the Mogwin Palace, we find new versions of Alban Orcs, Blood Red Alban Orcs who are almost as one with festering marshes and sport unusual blood abilities, such as growing and shooting hardened blood spikes. Even more interestingly is that we see near the entrance of the marshes, we find a group of blood albanoric standing over regular albanorics. So what is happening here? So I've gone over it a lot and I'm sure people are aware of this now, but the albanorics are a fairly oppressed people uh, and they don't really have their own place. I'm not going to go into more detail because this video is already ginormous and I could go off on a little bit of a tangent about it, but put it this way, the Alban Orcs haven't got a place in the world. So it's no surprise that a hated, hunted, displaced people like Alban Orcs could find salvation under the wing of the Lord of Blood, or at the very least it makes them susceptible to corruption by the Lord of Blood, by manipulation by the Lord of Blood. The scene that we are presented with at the entrance to the Blood Marshes where Blood Alban Arcs are guarding regular Arban Arcs makes it unclear whether they have come willingly or not, whether they have been captured and brought here, or whether they are simply initiates under guard by the existing Blood Alban Arcs. But given the positioning of the Alban Arcs at the Rose Church, I would, to me, suggest that they are enticed to come here for whatever reason, but when they come here, they are essentially put under the control of existing blood Alban Arcs. Yet how do Alban Arcs transform into the bloody variant? Well again, I'll refer to the most quoted item in, across all of my lore videos, the Alban Auric Blood Clot, where we learn that they are an artificial life form created by man, and they seem to have a malleable clay-like quality to them, which is why they bleed white fluid when we hit them. In my opinion, inductee alban arcs are then made to soak in the accursed, festering blood of the swamp, absorbing the accursed blood of Moog into their malleable bodies, turning them into fearsome, devoted, berserk warriors of the dynasty. These are the foot soldiers, these are the pawns of his new force. They're making up the numbers. We can definitely see the influence of Moog upon them. We can see clearly that the accursed blood has physically afflicted them, transforming their skin. But not only that, they can produce blood abilities from their malleable bodies. They can form blood spikes and fire them at us. And aside from that, most interestingly to me, is they are also being affected by the omen infection. At the top of their little heads, you can see omen horns just poking out of the top. Again, the omen blood is infecting these Alban Orcs as well as regular humans. Moog has now turned a lost, oppressed people into a fearsome group of foot soldiers. Indeed, there are an extraordinary number of Alban Orcs in the swamps, and I wonder if Ovni would laugh if he faced 1500 Alban Orcs at once. Aside from the Alban Orcs, we see that there is a cursed blood in the swamp that has altered other life forms, and they can provide fearsome war beasts and defences for Moog's dynasty. The already horrendously horrendous monstrous crows have been afflicted by the accursed blood. The warts that we identified earlier at the Rose Church are pretty present across these crows' body, again showing that they are now one with the dynasty, they share the blood of the dynasty, they have been warped by the accursed blood. Also present in the swamp are the bloodhounds. These are ones that we find in great numbers in the swamp and again are covered in the warts of the accursed blood, again showing them to be afflicted by the accursed blood, making them into fearsome war beasts 
that cause horrendous bleed, as I'm sure you have all experienced at one point or another. We for sure know that these dogs are to be used as warhounds for the dynasty, as Esgar himself uses them uh, when he fights us in his battle as if they are his trained dogs. The swamp itself is even transformed. It is volatile and dangerous, with blood geysers bursting out of the surface, scalding anyone unfortunate to be caught within its radius. Hopefully the crows. We already discussed the Swarm of Flies incantation, but let's look at it again when looking at the nature of the Accursed Blood. For the description of this incantation suggests that these deadly, bloodthirsty flies have actually spawned from the bloody mire surrounding the palace, specifically being grown in the blood-tinged excrement of the area. This seems like an almost perversion of the natural order of things. There is a new cycle of life found within the cessblood-afflicted beasts of the area. These cessblood-affected beasts produce festering bloody excrement, an item we can find all over the area, and the item description of this blood-tainted excrement reads as follows. The bloody excrement of a carnivorous beast, material used for crafting items, found in the land of the new dynasty, mixed inside with half-digested flesh or a dense colony of tiny eggs of unknown but assuredly revolting origin. The accursed blood warps even the natural world, creating new nightmarish bloodletting creatures that would normally just be a natural part of the normal life cycle. They exist within their own blood-tainted ecosystem. Now one understands the nightmares that the Dynasty of Blood would bring, as described by the Mogwin Palace map. Imagine this is a microcosm, a slideshow, of what the world would be like under the reign of the Lord of Blood and the Formless Mother. A hideous mutation of the existing world, where blood-tainted beasts fight each other, eat each other, and even horrible flies are born from their excrement that thirst for the blood of others. However, to reach that goal, that absolute paradise that we're all dreaming of, then Moog's central piece, central pawn, must really come into play for it is Mikola, the unalloyed, that is central to Moog's design, and it is he that we will ride upon to our new era with the Blood Lord. So now let us turn to Mikola, the potential Blood God. The secret at the heart of the Blood Dynasty is one that is taxed Ofnir for so long. The truth is that Mikla, the unalloyed, is now a permanent guest of the Lord of Blood. And indeed, in the opening cinematic to the game, we do see Moog carrying the infant Mikola under his arm. We get hints that it is Moog who has taken Mikola throughout various dialogues and item descriptions, even before we come face to face with the truth ourselves. For example, after you defeat Melania, after 13,000 tries, and find the Halig tree as a husk, and report back to Ofnir, he says the following. I heard speculation Mikola embedded himself in the Halig tree, but before he could finish, Someone cut the tree open and absconded with his infant form. Indeed, it seems those words held weight. So even here, Ofnir is hinting the fact that someone took him, and we later find out that's someone to be Moog, for reasons that we will discuss. Regardless, Moog snatched Mikola in his infant form, as per the words of Ofnir, and this is the childlike form we see in the opening cinematic cradled in Moog's arm. It is clear that Mikla then becomes the central piece to Moog's design, and he is intensely, intensely focused on keeping Mikla to himself and protected, for he is the most important part of the dynasty. This is made evident by the description of the Pure Blood Knight's medal, which reads, Used to be granted audience with Mo, only it is not time, for Mo yet slumbers beside the divinity. Be patient, the new dynasty is nigh. The term divinity shows how Moog views Mikla, a potential god. Not only that, but it seems to be directly linked to the coming of the dynasty, which Moog considers to still be going through the process of birthing. Moog doesn't consider the dynasty to be real, it doesn't consider the order that he's building to have come to fruition until Mikla rises as a new god. These such motivations of Moog are expanded upon from the Remembrance of the Blood Lord, which reads as follows. Remembrance of Moog, Lord of Blood, hewn into the Earth Tree. Wishing to raise Mikla to full godhood, Moog wished to become his consort taking the role of monarch. But no matter how much of his bloody bedchamber he tried to share, he received no response from the young Imperian. The formless mother wants a blood god, much as all outer gods want, so they can have a vessel for their power on the mortal plane. With Moog ruling at his side, Mikola would become the new god for the formless mother, much as Godfrey once stood at the side of Marika as the greater wills ruling dynasty. And in this we can see why Moog doesn't consider the dynasty to have been complete or fulfilled until 
we have a god, a blood god, Mikla, rising as the blood god, because ultimately Moog's aims are the formless mother's aims. They want to replace the current order with a blood order, and this can only be achieved when a new ruling body is in place, a lord and their god. In this, the formless mother and Mo cannot have chosen a better Empyrean to raise to godhood. There is something special about Mikla. He is a character we have zero interaction with, and yet we feel his effects all around us. He appears to be one of the most influential and powerful characters in the game. Melania, who herself is exceptionally powerful, seems to see Mikla as some higher potential for godhood. As her armour description quotes from her and she says the following, my brother will keep his promise. He possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. He is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. Mikla is of course deserving of his own video, but suffice it to say that Mikla's power seems to be his allure, the loyalty he aspires, and the exceptional wisdom that he displays that is at odds with his childlike appearance. Through his unalloyed gold, he seems to have the remarkable and unmatched ability to actually to actually resist the influence of the Outer Gods. This is something that we learn from the description of Mikla's Needle, which tells us that it was crafted to ward away the meddling of Outer Gods. And we can actually see that this is true if we use it on ourselves and remove the influence of the Frenzied Flame, therefore removing the meddling of the Outer God of the Frenzied Flame. How many more of the Demigods or Empyreans look beyond their own selfish desires to develop such impressive tools to help others? None are like Mikla, who many see as the defender of the meek and the dispossessed, and aside from anything else, he can actually challenge the outer gods. So it is no shock that this is the god that Moog and the Formless Mother want to use as their figurehead for their new blood dynasty. As the god of the Moogwin dynasty, he would bring the accursed blood to new exceptionally powerful levels, and Moog would be able to rule as the monarch, almost unopposed in the current world. Regardless, it is plain to see that Moog is trying to grow and warp Mikla into a full god, yet not naturally as Mikla probably would have intended. We know from Ofnir's dialogue that Mikla had embedded himself in the Halig tree for whatever reason, but that Moog ripped him out before he could finish what he was doing. For me, looking around the Halig tree, we see these other cocoons that are looking like Mikla's cocoons. So I would say that Mikla's cocoon is not the work of Moog, but was in fact the natural process of Mikola to try and grow himself to full godhood, perhaps to help his sister. But again, that is a story for another time. But regardless, I see the cocoon as Mikola's design. What I see as Moog's design is the fact that it is split open prematurely. And now Moog is tainting him with a little bit of blood, for we see that this is in fact the desire of Moog through the Lord of Blood's exaltation, a talisman that quotes from Moog himself directly, and it reads as follows. Render up your offerings of blood to your lord. Drench my consort's chamber. Slake his cocoon's thirst. His awakening shall herald the dawn of our dynasty. This neatly explains the role of the Bloody Fingers or the Pure Blood Knights, quote unquote. The spilling of blood, as far as Moog is concerned, is what will feed his cocoon's growth, and using blood specifically to slate the cocoon is of course an attempt to guide Mikla's development into a god to a god of blood specifically, warping the unalloyed's form, dousing his growing flesh with festering blood. Again, Moog seems to believe that the awakening of this blood god will herald the age of the Moogwin dynasty, as if it actually needs the god for it to be a legitimate dynasty. As I explained, this is because the aim of the dynasty isn't just to be a dynasty in the normative sense, it is to replace the ruling dynasty of the Erd Tree as the dynasty of the world, and for that, it needs the power of a god. This is why Mikla is so important to Moog. While we can't, you know, confirm that he has actually any real emotional attachment to Mikla, it would obviously be one way given that Mikla has been entirely unconscious the whole time, but regardless, we know that Moog is really focused on Mikla. We get this from the kind of way he spits at us, Mikla is mine and mine alone when he kills us during the boss fight, and we know that the fact that he has hidden Mikla down here in the depths and is keeping it secret from even the likes of Ofnir, who generally knows most things, shows that he is wanting to keep his claws very much firmly dug into Mikla. This is the centerpiece of his designs, Without Mikla, there is no Mogwin dynasty. And indeed, he takes his role as Mikla's consort seriously, even if there has been no relationship actually established between Mikla and Moog. It is a position he is forced upon Mikla himself. Indeed, he goes as far as 
playing the role of consort to share the chambers with his lord. And we see this described in the Pure Blood Knight's Medal. The bed chambers, as we see from the Blood Lord's Exaltation, is of course Mikola's cocoon. And we do in fact see that Moog is sharing these chambers with his lord, slumbering next to the divinity as we enter the boss room. After our chapter on reviewing the Accursed Blood and the transformative and transmutative abilities of it, it should be clear what happens at the onset of the boss fight in the initial cinematic. Moog is in blood form inside the cocoon, so he can actually fit inside these bedchambers, before he detects our presence and pours out into the floor, reforming himself in his corporeal form and apologises to Mikola for having to leave him by himself for a while while he battles us. This is how he shares the cocoon, the bedchambers, with his lord. He sleeps there in blood form. Yet it seems this entire time, despite the way that Moog speaks to Mikla and everything else, Mikla has been slumbering the whole time. Uh, this is what we get from the remembrance of the Blood Lord, where we get that he's had no response from Mikla, and the fact that Ofnir actually uses the term slumbering specifically when describing the way that Mikla is at this moment. Despite Mikla's incredible powers, I do believe that he is currently defenseless, caught in some kind of slumbering process that he began uh, not knowing he'd be kidnapped and he cannot waken from, and he is actually being corrupted by the fact his cocoon's been cracked open and he's been corrupted by the accursed blood of Moog, just as the Lord of Blood and the Formless Mother most likely desire. Indeed, the shining unalloyed of myth looks a little worse for wear, and at the same time, it does appear that he has indeed grown. Yet when he awakes, what will he be? I think it's clear that Mikla's journey will be fully dealt with later on, and later content. This room is so weirdly empty after Moog's death and Mikla is just there, it feels like he's there for an interactable purpose, but as of now, we cannot interact at all. So I'm sure we'll learn more of Mikla's fate and what's been happening to him since he's been poisoned by Moog all this time. And the way that Ofnir talks about the fact that everything should be fine if he doesn't wake from his slumber, suggests that Ofnir suspects that Mikla will be something terrible when he awakens. And this is no doubt a result of the interference and meddling by the Lord of Blood and the Formless Mother. Whenever he awakes, it is clear looking at his pallid skin and his sickly demeanour that Moog has been at least a degree successful in changing the unalloyed. And yet, ultimately, Moog never gets the chance to see if his god of blood will be as he imagined, whether he will be able to use him to raise up his Moogwin dynasty. Because we come to the palace ourselves, drawing Moog out from his captive's bedchamber, before destroying him and ending his dynasty before it began. Like the majority of Outer Gods, it seems as though the Formless Mother wished to supplant the Order of Grace with her own Order of Blood, with a God of Blood and a Lord of Blood, replacing the current Gods and Lords of the Erd Tree. We have glimpsed at what this future may bring. Bogs of festering blood, warped wildlife that craves blood, and bloated, bloodthirsty flies that thrive in every cistern. A nightmarish land, ruled over by the Lord of Blood and his puppet God, a harrowing future that will now never come to pass. Well, maybe. So thanks guys, that is my take on the Lord of Blood. Um, it's just, it's just so much. I, I didn't think that this would be a long video. I again thought this would be shorter than my Rykard video and uh, it's just ballooned and ballooned. I really need to maybe start focusing my efforts sometimes but it's just when I started opening it and looking at the effects of the Accursed Blood I just really got in deep. Um, so, but I hope I hope you appreciate the the look at, at what we did with Moog and and the Moogwin dynasty. Thing is, there's actually more to be said on some of the subjects or on Mikla himself. But I think that's deserving of a video of Mikla himself. This was Moog's video and the Moogwin dynasty. So I did have to cut it there, and it was getting some. It was getting ridiculously long already. So I did cut out actually a few pages on, on Mikla and, and some of my theories about him. So I'll, I'll deal with that another time. But I really needed to restrict this to Moog uh, and the Moogwin dynasty. Um, with that said, if you think I have missed anything pertinent, which I probably have because <laughs> I'm just delirious with having worked in this video for two weeks, then please let me know below. Um, aside from that, I'm going to start working on my next one straight away as soon as this one's done. But until next time, guys, I will see you in the Eternal City. Take care.